welcome back to Makers on Tap, the netcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Uh, I'm your host, Aaron. Oh, I'm just reading my script. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, Aaron. Keep going. I am your host tonight, Aaron, and joining me are Joe and Christian. All right, so tonight on this netcast slash podcast, however you want to, there you go. However you like to identify <laughs> it with, um, we'll be covering a lot of some interesting topics tonight, um, most of which are news. Um, I don't, we may or may not actually have any ma- running a makerspace uh, topics. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I didn't have any planned. Um, then we have for our main topic tonight, we're going to discuss uh, how we personally justify buying new tools or building new tools um but first off you know what is everybody drinking tonight so i've broken out the new glare sampler pack and i've got Mm. one of my old favorites simply spotted cow absolutely very nice awesome uh so i actually Funny enough, have a friend staying with us from the faraway land of Sweden. And so I have my first overseas beer with me tonight. Uh, it is called Rugglinger or Rugglinger. Um, and it is a wild berry hard cider. And so I am excited to be actually trying this out tonight. I'm surprised it's not flavored with fermented fish. Uh, so there's a whole story behind that, but we very much fought a very much not to have that in the house. <laughs> hey, no, I love those Swedish fish. <laughs> I love Swedish fish too, but not, not, not those one kinds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh-huh. my wife and I actually went to a local, uh, brew pub tonight. And so I actually have a crowler of. So it's called the blueberries taste like blueberries <laughs> is the actual name. And I'm about it. Yeah, it's a blueberry <laughs> cream ale. It's about All right. it's about on par with Rodell's cream blueberry cream ale. Um, I don't know. They're both really good. Nice. But I have a whole quart of it, thirty-two fluid ounces. That is <coughs> so much beer. Yes. <laughs> All right, so we can go ahead and get started with the news. Um, let's see. Open Builds has, well, they announced a brand new con- um, CNC control system. Uh, but the in this announcement was like two years ago, yeah. and it's been in development ever since. They've had you know very sparse updates on it. Um, it was originally called Apex which I thought was an awesome name for it. It's supposed to be the, they're, they're touting it's going to be like the end-all be-all CNC control system for 99% of all CNC use cases. So I'm, I'm really excited for it. Um, but then, let's see, earlier this year, they renamed it with some um, community feedback to the Open Builds Black Box. Yeah. And I'm not a huge fan of that name for an open source company, but... I, I think that's the point. It gets oh. kind of tongue in cheek. Tongue in cheek. All right, I, I can get they, behind that. Especially if you think about the people that are behind it. They the open builds guys are very. Um, I don't know. It, if you go back in the open builds um, history, before Mark started Open Builds Parts Store, he had a CNC company called Flat Boys, and. Um, just google it it's if i remember right it's boys it's b-o-y-z it's the <laughs> coolest cnc router i've ever seen i'm honestly i'm super sad that it doesn't exist anymore it took a a board and put it between a pinch roller on either side of the router and it pulled the board back and forth interesting it, oh. it, yeah, yeah. It, and if I remember right, it was mainly geared towards car audio companies, which I, you know, my my main history, what got me into like engineering was doing car audio install and building boxes and doing enclosure design. So like that holds a special place in my heart. But I found all these videos 
on YouTube, like early, early YouTube days of Mark like, building these machines and talking about them. So they like, would, I don't know. When, when I see them doing things like black box, I get excited because like, I, I understand the creativity that they're putting into all this stuff. Um, yeah. And sorry, it, and that, that took a tangent. No, that's totally <laughs> fine. Yeah. So um, there's a main thread on open builds forums called black box motion control system. And there's about three pages of comments over the past year um, from, you know, them saying, Oh, it's coming soon. Stuff like that. Um, well, but, I mean, yeah, they, they keep iterating it because they, they keep finding ways to make it better and cheaper and more functional. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Yeah, It's and hard to fault them, except that they announced it like two years ago. Like, I don't well, know, we'll say announce it when you're pretty sure you're done with the requirements phase. A, two years ago, though, everything like took a weird turn because that was right around the time that... Um, laser web was like getting really good and then the whole project direction took a turn mm -hmm. and that was right about the same time that smoothie technically got deprecated to smoothie 2 because the smoothie 2 project got announced but then like that's turned into a two-year thing too mm -hmm. and the black box slash apex was based on smoothie so i, th I think they were like trying to wait out smoothie 2 to like uh not release a controller based on old tech and like smoothie two is I think on their second Kickstarter now with, um, interesting, you know, no real prog progress, uh, lots of real progress, but no physical product yet. Right. So, so with this news announcement, um, there are a couple, um, uh, forum posts from Mark where he actually gave some details of the uh, current design, and it seems to be in their final prototyping phase. They actually have this this latest prototype in some commercial shops, getting some good um, job time for some testing. But he said that the current size of the black box is about six inches long by three inches wide by one and a half inches tall. So that's a pretty small footprint. Um. Yeah. They originally were going to try and squeeze some Trinamic drivers on there, but then the embedded ones they were wanting didn't seem to have proper documentation. They couldn't get to work reliably enough. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think they, they went back to the big Chinese drivers, didn't they? Yes, um, but they are, I believe they are embedded on the circuit board. Okay. But they're the, the Chinese-based, like, chips. Like TB sixty six hundreds or something. Yeah, but like embedded onto the circuit board, which allows them to get the small form factor. Nice. Those those chips are super reliable. I, they've been running. Mm -hmm. I've got fifteen of them running in my garage right now, and I've never had an issue with a single one. So. Yeah, yeah, and I think they said I think there's someone here where it said there it can go up to like five amps. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, you for, you for can push some big motors. Yeah, so I'm super excited. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on is they used some interesting word choices in some of these posts. So I know they have Peter Vanderwalt, who was originally with the LaserWeb project, right? He he started it, yeah. Yeah, so he is on their team now, and he's been working very hard on on the Black Box project. And an interesting wordage they they continue to use is an all-in-one CNC control solution. So it's not necessarily a controller, but it's a it's a CNC application mm. solution, which you know in in uh, combination with essentially the next news topic, which is their um, Open Builds Cloud Cam software when it's a beta. Um, if you look at the pictures of the old Apex controllers, they have an Ethernet port on the side. So, I'm curious if that board will allow you to locally host this cloud cam software and maybe an additional um, G code interpreter. Well, so that it could be like an all in one thing on the board. For the people who can't see what I'm holding in my hand right now, 
It's a uh, Smoothie Brains controller, which was an early Peter Vanderwalt project right around the time Smoothie came out. And its idea was that this is simply a breakout board for the Smoothie controller. So every pin on the LPC, uh, whatever chip this is, is broken out and accessible, um, as well as an... Uh, ESP8266, uh, an Ethernet port, and um, a GLCD header. So with this, um. you can wirelessly access the uh, smoothie board, which basically gave you Pronder face mm -hmm. uh, to control your printer or your CNC machine or whatever. And mm -hmm. every um, step direction PWM on whatever header that the smoothie could break out. And this was Peter's idea for a uh, CNC controller solution that had uh, daughter boards and um, some interesting little guys uh, that could like bolt up underneath it or uh, whatever. Um, but, you know, this could control anything. And I think the Apex, uh, which came out right around the time that Peter... Uh, joined the open builds team was his next iteration on the brains controller. It sounds like it. So, because the stuff that I'm reading it seems to hint at something like that. Yeah. So if there's only an Ethernet port broken out on that, that would be my guess. Is it? You know, they're they're pulling the Ethernet port into the LPC. What is this thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, they have it in, uh, yeah, they have those prototypes working on some commercial machines right now to get some usability testing, but I'm excited to see where that goes. Me too. I'm very excited. Um, Peter makes also, great stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I was a fan of LaserWeb before they took that um, turn in direction and started to do other cam stuff. And they kind of ignored the workflow. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. So also, Mark made a new thread on the Open Builds forums for their new cloud cam software. So that allows you to plug in, you know, if you have an, an Open Builds Acro laser or one of their CNC routers or mills, um, it can help you generate the cam tool paths um, for that machine and do it all in the cloud and it will in the cloud slash in your browser. Um, yeah. I was playing with it and it's mostly just done in your browser. But um, it will actually generate your your tool path, and you can download the G code from that, and then there's, run it on your machine. There's a local version that you can get, though, isn't there? I don't know that it still it still runs in the browser, but I don't think it necessarily runs off there. No, right. Uh, so when you when you load this up, you know it's a it's some it, it may not be a progressive app, but it's a a, a client side rendered web app. So okay. it, it loads the resources from the server, but all of the processing is done on your local machine in your browser. Right. So it's not something like Easel or Chili Pepper where you're going to a website and using a website to run your machine. Yeah. Which that I'm sorry. Work. It's just inherently unsafe. Well, I couldn't <laughs> even access Chili Pepper this morning or yesterday when we were talking about it in our Slack channel. I was yeah. like, because I'd never checked it out and I tried to. It's like, well, it doesn't work in my browser. I can't even load it. Yep. Yeah, it only works if you like Chrome. Um, yeah, I was in Firefox. Yeah, for for those of you that don't know, Chili Pepper and Easel are the Chili Pepper is a uh, CNC control software that can be used with Gerbil or Smoothie or um, Tiny G is what it was developed for, and those are flavors of USB controllers. Um, but they. Uh, um, now they they can all run through this web page, and it's very pretty, uh, but it has it has its issues. And Easel is a cam slash control software that was released by um, the Inventables guys with the uh, X Curve and the Carvey. I think either the X Curve or the Shape Oko. I never could keep those two straight, so. <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, I just want to point out 
those two things from open builds because uh they weren't necessarily publicly announced they just kind of shadow released like hey this is in beta right and and hey here's a couple updates for the people following the thread that's why the camp pump. software is super cool i'm yeah. actually very excited for it yeah the ua is actually really nice and yes. that's something that i like i like to you know point on as a as a full stack developer i like to point out good uis when i see them looking at you bcnc <laughs> Which is a great software, but boy, is it ugly. <laughs> I actually got that loaded on the Pi that I'm using for the, uh, I'm converting oh, to that router. Remind me after we get done, I, I, did I send you the image that I was going to send you? Probably not. Okay. Well, remind me after this podcast and I'm going to send you an image okay. of uh, a uh, ready to run CNC controller. Sweet. Oh my God, Facebook. So my phone's next to me and I'm watching a uh, Facebook conversation from a wedding that I was in this weekend kind of roll by. And as I said, remind me, Facebook Messenger just popped up and it was like, would you like me to put a reminder in? I'm not using text to speech, Facebook. (laughs) That's where you're wrong, kiddo. Oh, it's so creepy. You're always away from me, big You're brother. always using touch to speech. <laughs> <sighs> see. Yeah. That that could be a whole podcast. It could be of just that me was... of just me rambling about privacy. That was the creepiest thing I've seen in since since the uh pop up ad I got for the um PLC controlled flow sensors that I didn't even know existed two minutes before I got the pop up ad, but was having a conversation with somebody about them. PLC controlled yeah. flow sensors. Yeah. So it like when so... it detects flow, it activates a relay on the sen- on the controller. It, or... it was a liquid flow through a pipe that we were trying to sense, and not only did they send me uh, the flow sensor ad, but it was for the exact flow sensor we were talking about nice i didn't know these things existed so it wasn't like i had searched for them before (laughs) that's always handy yeah (laughs) anyway yeah so for the last yeah the last news segment that i have found um a guy on hackaday actually the um the guy who runs the cnc kitchen youtube channel did okay. a video series on measuring the stiffness of 3D printed parts. So he said, you know, depending on your project, you may not want the strongest material. You may just want something that's stiff or not stiff. You want something flexible. So he did a whole um, series video series on a rig that he put together to measure, um, I don't know what you call this, the torsion, the bendiness. Right, <laughs> yeah. Of uh, printed parts and uh, the, the, the strength. The That's ductilness. an engineering term. The what? The the uh, ductileness. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm not good with words today. Yeah, he he made a dingus that measures that stuff. Right. <laughs> and he he explains it way better than I could, but I thought what, that was really interesting. What's really fun about this is how he he talks about the rigidity of materials versus the strength. Yeah. Um, which I think people get very very confused when they're they're not used to um, engineering terms. Um, so a lot of people will say that PLA isn't strong because it breaks very early, and it's that's not it at all. It's PLA actually its tensile strength is incredibly high and its rigidity is very high, but because of those two things, it will shatter very early in its deformation. Um, unlike ABS, which is very ductile or nylon, which is incredibly ductile. Um, so I, I think these, uh, these videos and this rig are like excellent to explain to people, uh, material science when they're getting into, um, something that very much needs, a decent understanding if you're trying to make um, machines and stuff. Yeah, with, with 3D printing, and he not even just making Yoda heads. And he even mentioned <laughs> in the video that uh, you 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 can't really rely on data sheets all the time. 
because right. they're usually inflated with you know marketing speak or you know well, it's, they're using actual. He actually said um, a lot of those data sheets are, um, for the material is used for injection molded parts, yes. which does not translate when you're talking about you know layers of a print. Yeah, if you look at mm. any material data, even the commercial material data from the big guys like Stratasys and 3D Systems, if you look in the fine print when you look at their um, strength data, it, it even says in there, these are all numbers for injection molding because that's the only way to um, to really rate it because everything is so dependent on your geometry and your print parameters and the print direction and all of that in mm -hmm. in the additive world. So yeah, so um, he he covers most of that in the video, which I thought was really awesome. Yeah. So I that, learned a lot from it. That was super cool. Yeah. So yeah. So those were the three things that I found this week that I wanted to share. Um, Joe, actually, did you want to touch quickly on the uh, the net deep nest? Oh, yeah. So um, through a discussion I was having on a Facebook group uh, for laser engraving, um, I found a new nesting software that is it's actually based off of SVG nest. We found out as we were going through the source. Uh, it's an open source uh, nest software called Deep Nest. And uh, the what website, is nesting, Joe? Nesting is when you have multiple parts, either the same part or different parts, and you would like them all to fit into one specific sheet or multiple specific sized sheets. Uh, you run an algorithm called nesting, and it kind of like try and trial and error fits them all together, and uh, hopefully gives you a very efficient material usage for all of your parts. Um, it's an incredibly CPU dependent and very difficult problem to solve. So it's really fun to see more people getting into it. Um, before in the open source nesting world, we had a tool called SVG nest and it did that it nested SVGs. Um, but a lot of people, especially that use laser cutters, use things like DXFs and other file formats which Deep Nest is now diving into to handle. Um, and it's an open source software that is running on cross-platform that is based on SVG Nest, but boy, it's pretty. Yes, um, this guy <laughs> made a killer UI for it. It is awesome. Yeah. yeah. So and, in terms of, because like, I'm, I'm kind of new to this and I'd, I'd like to get more involved in the laser etching and I plan when we actually get our laser back up and running to use it a lot more. Would this be comparative to you design and fusion the part that you want to print? And then this is taking it into like Cura to get it, the G code for it. Or is this another part in that line of getting it ready for the cut? Imagine, would, imagine you are that. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine okay. you have a complex part, you know, if, if you want to take your Cura example and you have, a, there's a lot of parts to print for that model. Um, this software essentially will arrange them onto the build plate in an efficient manner to use the least amount of space, essentially. Yeah. Except so, okay. take this to SVG vector formats and it's squeezing all of the objects as close together as possible or even sharing lines. Yeah. So instead of cutting the same line twice for different objects, um, they'll, they'll bump two objects up to each other and share the same line. So that's just one cut with yep. the router or the laser. Oh, yeah. Interesting. And okay. this is really nice because uh, you can define the, the space between the parts and the tolerance for the rotation, how many times it, it can rotate the parts. Um, it, it's a, uh, oh man, it even has an option for merging common lines. If you're using a laser, that's, that's awesome. So you're not cutting the same line twice. That saves so much time. Yeah. But that UI, man, I can't get over it. it. And you can awesome. specify your DXF import units and export units. I don't know who you are. Hang on a second. What's this dude's name? Mr. Jack. <laughs> Jack Chow. Jack in zero 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 on GitHub. But good yeah. job. He is an indie software developer based in Vancouver, Canada. 
So he has a pay what you want essentially license on the website for it. Yeah, but also, no license on GitHub. So right. get it now while there's no license. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, don't. I don't know. Um, but yeah, nesting is really, really useful. Um, if you need a good example for when you would use a nest, um, one that they kind of have in their logo is or on the website is if you needed to cut out a whole bunch of letters, like you, if you were going to cut out the alphabet and you didn't want all the negative space that would show up if you just cut out the alphabet in straight lines. If you wanted to use all that negative space for your letters, you could bring all of the uh, vectors for those letters into this and then tell it this is the negative space I want you to fill. Say it's a sheet that's uh, 12 inches by 24 inches. And then it would run its algorithms to rotate all of those shapes and fit them together into that sheet and tell you if you needed to use more than one sheet. So interesting. They even have um, a little graphic on the on the main page where it talks yeah, about what it does. And then when you scroll down a bit, it rearranges all the letters and yeah. the materials and it takes up like half the size it used to. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a very difficult problem to solve and almost any time you get into a software that is dealing with um, flat sheet materials, whether it's lasers or routers or plasma cutters or water jets, um, the first question people ask is, does your software do nesting? And if it does, how good is your nesting? And <laughs> if it doesn't, when will your software do nesting? <laughs> um, it, it's, a, it's a really uh, common thing, so... This stuff seems to be pretty nice. Yeah. I am sent it to a ton of friends today. Yeah, I'm excited my, to try it out. Yeah, it's, it's definitely piqued my interest to where when I actually start cutting more, I am going to be excited to use this. I'm already downloading it right now as we talk. Yep. Nice. So that was all the news I had, um, unless you guys had anything else you wanted to cover. Nope. I'm good. Do either of you have any makerspace running things you want to talk about? Um, just the uh, you know, right now our space is going through a bylaw uh, revision, and I don't necessarily want to talk about the revision itself, but I I think that um, you know, for organizers of a makerspace. Uh, maybe think about looking at your bylaws closely and how your space is currently operating, at least on a biannual basis. This is the first time that we've taken a really deep dive into how our bylaws work in probably three and a half years. And we found so many different ways that our bylaws don't work for our organization anymore. And, and so we're revising everything and we'll be voting on those this month. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably a pretty critical thing, and it's one of those administrative things that nobody likes to do. So I'm really glad we've got a couple of people that seem to, if not like it, uh, are really good at it now. I don't know, uh, man. I think I think Jim loves it. <laughs> he lives for those <laughs> kinds of things. So. Like he just well, came up to a, a meeting and he's like, "Hey guys, I have some updates for the bylaws. You want to check them out?" And it's like pages of revisions. <laughs> Long live Jim. <laughs> it's it's been really interesting because like and this might if you are listening to this from another makerspace that you help organize, um, we kind of found out through the process that a lot of the quote unquote rules that we like to rule by were not actually in our bylaws. Yeah. <laughs> that a lot of them were just kind of like, no, nah, we kind of go by that. Yeah. And <laughs> we could have very much been taken advantage of had we not iron those things out. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely check your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Or it could have seemed like we were taking advantage of the membership by saying, oh, uh, well, this is, this is how the officers do it. This is in the bylaws, but then no one checks the bylaws. And then we look like liars when they come back and say, nah, you didn't say it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad we're taking a look at that finally. I'm glad somebody is going through the effort of doing it. So. Yeah, no, it, it, it's it been a huge help for us going forward. As it totally we, has. Uh, we get ready for this next chapter. Yep. 
All right. So with that, we can probably go into the main topic, which is how do we justify buying new tools or building new tools? <laughs> uh, Joe, you can go ahead and kick us off if you want. <laughs> I heard that you have some secrets <laughs> on how to get spousal how you, approval. How do you get away with this? Will you spill your secret of how you actually get away with this? <laughs> It's because my wife loves me. I have. Oh. I don't know. Uh, she's incredibly. I. I constantly talk about how um, the only reason I can do what I do is because of how incredibly supportive my wife is, and um, she just stopped asking questions a long time ago, and <laughs> that seems to work for us. <laughs> <laughs> the bills keep getting paid, and everything's fine with it. <laughs> Nice. No, but I do take tool investment very seriously because um, I have a lot of them and, and uh, a lot of my tools are pretty expensive. So, um, you know, I, uh, I don't necessarily, um, I don't know. So... So in uh, in the interview episode with NYCNC, he had mentioned that um, I can't remember if it was his shop or him personally, where he waits until he cannot, he can no longer live without that machine, as far as jobs, right? And then he gets it, and that's how he handles getting new machines. Whereas for me personally, I don't I. I I'm I'm a hobbyist, so I don't necessarily have jobs coming in or side yeah. jobs coming in. So for me, it's more of, you know, I like the idea of having, like, so right now I'm kind of desi designing a DIY diode laser cutter. For me, it's like I have a lot, I have a lot of things that I could do if I had a laser cutter, at the, you know, in my basement. So, yes. you know, and and for me, it's more of I don't necessarily have a need for it, but I could do a lot more if I had it. So, like, for for most of my tools, it's, especially my CNC-driven tools, they have been more projects themselves than tools. Um, most of them are, are now getting into the tool point where I have trouble imagining um, my shop and my abilities without having a laser cutter or without having a CNC router now. Uh, because I've had them for so long, but they definitely started out as uh, I wonder if I could build a CNC router, you know, long before having a CNC router was a necessity in my life. Um, but when I get into things like um, my more manual tools, like I recently bought a new miter saw this year, um, it was uh, kind of like a um, an inventory of my projects and how often I use my saw and the holdbacks of uh, the current saw that I had and, um, you know, what I needed to gain versus uh, what I, I was able to do currently. And if I could do those things on a different tool and um, my main holdback on my current saw was it doesn't turn off. Um, so you, you just, you pull the trigger and you can let it go as many times as you want. And, uh, it just keeps going, which is, that sounds like eight. a safety hazard. Yeah. Um, if you hit it enough times in the handle with your fist, it will eventually shut off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that American ingenuity, just keep hitting it till it works. Yeah. You know, but I've had that saw for 10 years. I use that saw for all kinds of stuff. So, you know, I didn't really hesitate. Like it wasn't one of those things where I was like, I could just let that miter saw die. Like I knew I needed a miter saw, especially for some big projects I had coming up, like uh, working on floors and um, redoing some stuff in our house. And um, so I didn't really hesitate when I was like, all right, I've had this saw for 10 years and I've used it constantly. I'm going to buy a good saw this time. And uh, that also allows me to, uh, slide so I can do longer cuts that will maybe make it so I never have to get out my table saw because I hate my table saw. 
um, kind of thing. I hear you say that so much about table saws. I hate them. I hate them so much. <laughs> you know, when when you need a table saw, you need a table saw. But I will do everything I can to avoid using them. I need to get a miter saw. I have I a mean, really nice green one that uh, you don't even have to pull the trigger on after the first time. You can just have it. <laughs> Someone called that accessory. <laughs> It's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> right? <Nice. laughs> no, yeah. that's, uh, that's interesting. Like, I don't know. It, it's kind of been an interesting thing for me of buying new tools because for the longest time now, um, some would say the last four years, uh, I really haven't need to buy new tools because I've been a part of the makerspace. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been kind of the nice thing of being part of the makerspace is – uh, not needing to, but for my own home stuff, that's kind of actually freed up money to invest in very particular things. Um, so instead of having to build out an entire workshop um, for me to be able to do projects, I've been able to focus on very individual things per se, uh, the recording and doing this podcast. I've been able to dump a lot more money into that specifically than I have been able to or that I would have been able to had I been building out an entire shop in my basement. Right. Um, so that's always been kind of a cool thing is like being a part of a makerspace allows me to upgrade in very specific ways instead of having to maybe build out at a much more budgeted level. And it, that brings up an interesting point that for me, um, last year or year before I actually sold one of my main tools in my shop, my lathe, because we have a really nice lathe at the makerspace. And for as often as I used it, I could redirect the money that the lathe represented and the shop space towards other things that I wanted to use more often. And then when I needed to use a lathe, go use the really nice lathe that we had at the makerspace. Um, so that was a really nice thing for having RCL available to me is like, well, you know, I, I don't necessarily need this. I can yeah. just go use the one at the makerspace. Yeah. Yeah. And on the flip side, um, back at the old makerspace building, when the lasers were fully assembled and working, I was using the lasers so much. And now I'm like, well, I'm tired of driving to the space all the time to use the lasers. Yep. You know, you know, it was kind of like a trial thing where I, you know, I have so many projects that could easily use something laser cut or laser etched that now I'm, I'm planning out building my own for my basement so that I don't necessarily have to leave my house to. So for me, I want to make like um, project boxes for all these small IOT sensors or home automation projects that I want to do. So instead of buying a case, I can just quickly laser etch a tabbed box and glue it together. Yep. You know, now instead of driving to the space, I can just go downstairs and cut something out of some balsa wood. And that's been a big selling point that I've been able to push people to the space with that they were like, well, I don't know if I could use a 3D printer or if I would use a laser or um, yeah, I don't really have uh, the space or money for a wood shop. It's like, oh, well, we have the maker space available. And w when you hit a point where you just can't, use the stuff at the space anymore um josh ran into the same thing uh where he makes um hitch covers as a saint jude marathon fundraiser things every year and he was spending like 40 hours a week for a couple weeks every year um welding up these hitch plates and uh, this year he finally bought his own welder because he just couldn't justify um, the time away from his family anymore to be making yep. the hitch covers. That's where um, I'm at now. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, I can't afford to be gone from the house that much anymore, so now so the now home shop is to... more attractive. Yep. Well, and that's like, like Joe said, that's been such a huge selling point for so much people coming to the makerspace is, um, hey, I really want a 3D printer. Well, do you really want a 3D printer or do you want to print off something for one time? Yeah. And giving people that experience of being like, oh, no, like this is freaking awesome. I'd love to incorporate this in many more projects that I'm involved in. Okay, now consider getting a printer or vice versa. Oh, this is a lot of work to get one thing printed. 
maybe I need to think about this at a different avenue. And we could, like, there's been so many times where we've been, do you really need to 3D print that? I think you're thinking 3D printing is such a cool fascination. Why don't you try laser cutting? Because that would actually be way better for this project in the long run for you. Yeah. And so it's giving people the ability to try so many different avenues of using tools in the makerspace that uh, they really get to be able to justify what they might buy in their personal workshops at home. Yeah. And then uh, one of the other things that I really look at when I'm looking at investing in a tool is um, if, if I'm not sure I'm going to use it as much as I would like um, or I'm not sure what will work for me is uh, I either look at um, trying to find the tool used uh, or renting the tool or buying the absolute cheapest version of um, the tool or item that I'm looking at just to see if it's going to work out for what I want. Um, a really good example of that was when I started working on a whole bunch of video things. I was trying to find a shotgun mic and I was looking at a pretty expensive shotgun mic and um, somebody was like, go buy the cheapest shotgun mic you can buy and then see if you're going to use it as much as you think you're going to. And mm -hmm. I, I think they knew uh, that that answer was no uh, before I started. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that was um, hundreds of dollars that uh, they saved me. And I've ended up going through like three of the cheap shotgun mics for how I've used them now. But they they ended up working almost as good as the very expensive one um, and were 10 times cheaper. So, you know, that, that gave me the ability to save all that money. And, you know, I, even though I've bought three of them, I'm still way money ahead in that. So sometimes, you know, buying the cheap version, whether it be the Harbor Freight version or just like the, the Chinese knockoff version of um, a product isn't necessarily the worst thing to do. But I will give that with a caveat. Um, buying cheap Chinese uh, 3D printing equipment, I, I just can't stand by it because of the safety hazards that are involved in so many of them. Um, ap after participating in all of the online communities for 3D printing that I, I am and seeing all the safety hazards in the really cheap... Uh, knockoff or uh, clone world um, I just can't stand by uh, cheaping out on on that stuff especially when the good uh, legit stuff is isn't that much more expensive like it's no. not worth risking your house over <laughs> yeah yeah quite literally risking your house over so and that's it that's a huge thing whenever you are looking into getting a new tool for yourself is always making sure that it is the right tool for you never going beyond what you feel comfortable as a user using. Yeah. So that's an interesting uh, take on it, Joe, because that's actually how I approach new hobbies, which yeah. is I'm not like I'm interested in this new thing, but I'm I could easily go overboard and spend a lot of money on like good. Cause like, you know, you, you join all these communities and you're like, and they say recommend, Oh, well, you know, you could get the cheap tools, but they're not going to last you long. But who knows if you're actually going to last long in this hobby. Yes. So, for <laughs> instance, you know, earlier this year, I, I was really interested in leatherworking. So, I actually, and, and, you know, you could easily, you know, spend hand over foot on leatherworking tools because it, it goes deep. Yeah. But, you know, I, I kind of cheaped out and I just got like a, a $30 Amazon hand tool kit just to try my hand at it. But it's been almost a year now and I haven't touched it. So, you know, that, that, that kind of, so it's just sitting, you know, in the other room, just waiting for me to go, come around to it. And then even when we start this, started this podcast, I had never done any sort of audio recording before. And I'm like, oh, this is really interesting, you know? And then, oh my gosh, audio equipment. You can, oh my you, God. Can, you can easily spend, <laughs> yeah. spend so much money. So I'm like, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll take my same route. I'll look at the options, find the good value, something that works with Linux for sure. But, you know, then start cheap. Yep. And who knows if we even go past two episodes. And here and we are. look at us at eight. Yeah. 
eight episodes <laughs> in, you know, three or so specials. Yeah. So now I'm starting to be like, well, you know, maybe maybe there's a, a better upgrade from this blue Yeti, Yeti that I'm using. Yeah. You know. Well, and that was... I, I, I that was the like, same for me. Uh, yeah. Because you're using my blue Yeti. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes. and and it was when I bought that, I I was starting to get into making uh video tutorials for people. And then when it was like, oh, I'm gonna make money at this, I should spend some more money on my setup. Um and, and not because like, oh, the money's coming in, so I'm gonna go spend the money. It was uh um like a different level of uh, recording that I needed to do. So I had to go up to the next level of um, what I needed equipment wise, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that you went to the Yeti, which is perfect for our podcast. Um, mm. Yeah. It, so I got into know. this with only a hundred dollars Yeah, you know, between a used blue Yeti and a cheapo mic stand. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, I have a nicer mic, but I'm still using a, a eight dollar mic stand. So, you know, whatever. Uh, another really good example of being able to dive in way too deep uh, if you read the forums too much is photography. Oh yeah. Oh my oh, god, god, dear god. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm looking at my my photography obsession collection right now, and you know, don't get me wrong. I use it not like I used to, but I still use my camera all the time. But man, like my camera is still, uh, it's like prosumer, but it's still so low end compared to what it could be. It, and if you get sucked into the gear forums, oh, it's a black hole. It is, it is literally a black yeah. hole. It is never, nothing's ever good enough. And everyone's like, oh, do you see the purple fringe on the side of your photo? And, and, and you're like, and then you're like, do I? I'm not even sure I do. And it, <laughs> That sounds like the it's, audio file forums. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think those are even more subjective. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all over the place. When it, and it kind of is. Whenever you get into a specific hobby, it's just immediately like, no, we're going to sick you down into this just deeper and deeper like i was looking at new headphones for our podcast and like immediately started getting into like sennheiser stuff and like some sure stuff and it was like all of a sudden i'm looking at like thousand dollar headphones like what the crap (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah, what is this right (laughs) yeah but you know the reality of it is like most of the time when i'm recording this podcast i'm my monitors are $8 skull candies and that's what I'm editing the podcast in. And I hear the same thing as you guys, the Sennheisers. Trust me. You know, (laughs) you know why? Because you're not really hearing that. (laughs) Your hearing's not that good. (laughs) Nobody's is. Nah, dude, my, uh, my audio cable has built an antivirus. (laughs) <laughs> so i don't hear any of those viruses man I... all of those all those viruses <laughs> just coming in through the mic when, when i was doing um audio stuff uh for the car audio world i was i was act- also doing home audio install on the side and there was this guy i did install for and he had thousand dollar speaker cables that oh, I my. I hooked up for him. They were six feet long, and the the string of adjectives to describe these cables on the box was incredible. They had a specific bend radius that they could tolerate, and I remember hooking them up for the guy, and then like sitting down and listening to his HD CD because that was a thing back in the day, <laughs> and. <laughs> and uh, he was like, oh, do you hear the warmth and the difference? <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, I do hear the warmth. That's your tube amp. That made a difference. Those cables. Whatever, man. I, <laughs> yeah, I hear it. I just had to humor him because he was such a nice guy. I liked him so much. <laughs> 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 but no. 
I don't. And I've got perfect. <laughs> I've got really good hearing. Not perfect, but really good. So if you take anything away from this podcast, I, I think the things to take away are. Um, or a netcast. Per- uh, forgiveness is better than permission. <laughs> Return policies are a thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, before you dive headfirst into something, one, make sure you can see the difference. Two, rent before you buy, if at all possible. And three, maybe go with the cheap thing for like six or eight months and make sure you're actually going to stick with it because nothing's worse than having a $30,000 machine in your garage that you've never used. Absolutely. That, that is a reality for a lot of people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, that's, I, I couldn't agree more. So, all right. I think that concludes our discussion for the night. Yeah. This is this topic ended up being a lot more fun than I thought it would be. Yeah, it also went a lot yeah. longer than we thought it would. <laughs> it's which about right on. Yeah, it is about right on, which is why I was trying starting to call it because <laughs> we we just hit the fifty minute mark. That's usually oh. when we uh, call it. Awesome. All right. Well, yeah. So thanks uh, for listening. Yeah, feel free to hit us up on any of the social medias. We're on just about all of them. Um, uh, we're on our subreddit. Um, we what we want any any and all sort of feedback on the show, um, and you can get that get that to us however you feel appropriate. Um, and we just got a new outlet this week. We're now on Spotify. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Spotify so, just opened up uh, open beta for the new podcast platform. Um, they now opened it up to essentially everybody. Yeah. So we I, I got us up there this week. Good job. So, yep. Thank you. Super exciting. All right. Well, with that, I'm out. Yep. All right. Keep Thank making you guys stuff. And we'll see you next week. Bye.